so yeah, it's a pleasure to have uh, Alexei Korshkov today. Um, so Alex, Alexei, uh, that is, uh, did both of your PhD and your undergrad in Harvard, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, then he was a postdoc uh, at the same time with me at Caltech. And now, yeah, since then he moved to Maryland. Uh, so he has a joint position between uh, JQI and University of Maryland. I guess, is that right? Yeah, well, officially the position, yeah, yeah, officially the position is at NIST, but, uh, you know, I sit at the university, I, I, uh, I advise my students and postdocs there, yes. I see. Yeah, they're doing great stuff in quantum optics, atomic physics, condensed matter, and uh, especially he likes long-range interactions, which we'll hear about today. Okay. Like, thanks, Nadanel, uh, and uh, thanks, everybody, for, uh, you know, uh, coming to the talk, and uh, it's a pleasure to be virtually in Israel. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, right, so I'll talk about uh, dynamics of quantum systems with long-range interactions. Maybe one thing I should mention, I didn't put it here, I should have, is that uh, uh, JQI and uh, Quix, our Quantum Information Theory Center, both offer uh, postdoctoral fellowships uh, annually, and now is actually about the time to apply. So the deadline either has just passed or about to pass. So if you're interested in coming uh, for a postdoc position on a fellowship uh, uh, or have students or have, have students who are interested in that, please, uh, you know, apply or have them apply. Um, so um, um, because of screening do typical- Do you accept virtual postdocs? Uh, say it again? Do you accept virtual postdocs? That's a great question. So we're actually uh, we're actually trying to make that work. Uh, it's uh, it's it's tricky. Uh, I mean, maybe by by kind of doing a sub award, you know, uh, if like the person actually stays at the university and we just send money. Uh, let's see if we can make that work. Uh, we haven't done that yet, but we're about to make that work. To try to make that work. So yes, maybe that's actually possible. <laughs> that would but, be great. Right. Yeah. So please apply, and then we'll figure out if it works. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the question. Right, so long range interactions. Um, because of screening, typical condensed matter systems uh, are often well described by short range interactions, by which I mean interactions that have either strictly finite range or decay exponentially with distance. On the other hand, um, AMO and other synthetic quantum systems are often well described by long range interactions, that is interactions that decay slower than an exponential. And today we'll focus on these interactions that decay as a power law with distance, uh, one over R to some power alpha. So examples are dipolar interactions, one of R cubed, uh, between electric dipoles such as Rydberg atoms, excitons of polar molecules, or magnetic dipoles such as magnetic atoms or in V centers. You can also have one of R to the six interactions between Rydberg atoms, van der Waals interactions, or you can have a uh, one of our R to the alpha interactions with tunable alpha or other more complicated forms of interactions uh, between um, ions and ion crystals or uh, between atoms uh, in multimode cavities or along waveguides, where in the first case, interactions are mediated by phonons and in the second case, they're mediated by photons. So here's an example of a 53 uh, uh, qubit uh, ion chain uh, in Chris Monroe's lab. Um, uh, and of course, the Rydberg systems have been picking up recently. Uh, you can trap your atoms either in optical lattice or in a closely related uh, tweezer array configuration. Uh, and then you can get things like uh, arrays of about you know, 200 of these Rydberg interacting uh, atoms uh, or here 36 by 36 uh, tweezer array. So this is all very, very exciting. Or you can get a chain. Um, so the reason why this is so exciting that uh, these long range interactions are uh, among the strongest and most tunable interactions available in AMO. And so they're ideal for studying strongly interacting quantum antibody physics and uh, building quantum technologies such as quantum computers, entanglement enhanced sensors and nodes of the quantum internet. So uh, long range interactions have uh, lots of interesting features. Uh, for example, uh, they can allow you to send an unknown quantum state uh, faster over a long distance. So if you have a chain and you only have short range interactions and you're trying to send a qubit from the uh, blue uh, site to the red site, then with short range interactions, you can essentially not do much faster than just swaps. Um, on the other hand, if you have a strong direct long range interaction between the uh, blue qubit and the red qubit, you know, it's clear that you might be able to go faster. 
So by the same token, uh, long range interactions can allow you to do faster quantum computing, faster preparation of entangled states, et cetera. And they can also, uh, for many body physics, uh, they can mask the dimensionality of the system. In particular, if you have all to all interactions, it doesn't even matter what dimension your system really sits in. So today we will discuss how quickly can quantum information propagate in these long-range interacting systems. And to do this, I need to introduce these uh, Lee Robinson bounds. So uh, consider a lattice in arbitrary dimension, uh, but I will draw 1D for simplicity. And let's suppose that B is a unitary operator uh, on a given site. And uh, we have an observable A, a distance R away. Um, and then we start with an arbitrary initial state Psi, and we're interested uh, in the uh, time evolution of this observable A under our Hamiltonian, Heisenberg evolution, in which case the effect on this observable A uh, uh, after time T due to the disturbance B at time zero uh, can be expressed as follows. So you take the expectation value of uh, A uh, of T uh, in the initial state, and you subtract it from the expectation value of A in a state Psi uh, with B applied to it. So what, the, what difference does the application of B make to A of T? So now let's do some math on this. Um, uh, first, uh, let's insert B dagger B here, uh, which is identity. And now you notice that we have a commutator, A of T B minus B A of T. So that, let's write it explicitly. Now uh, we bound uh, the expectation value by the uh, uh, magnitude of the largest eigenvalue. That's what this operator norm means. And finally, because B is a uh, unitary, uh, this doesn't change the operator norm with the largest eigenvalue. And we get this largest eigenvalue of an unequal time uh, commutator. Uh, and we call this the signal after time t a distance r away. And this is what Lee Robinson bounds uh, provide the bound on this unequal time commutator. So let's consider a special case, short range interactions. And we suppose that our Hamiltonian is sum uh, of uh, nearest neighbor interactions uh, where HI I plus one acts on sites I and I plus one. And then we assume that it's bounded. The size of the largest eigenvalue is bounded by one. But other than that, uh, subject to this constraint, we allow for arbitrary time dependence. Furthermore, I didn't write them here, but we will even allow for arbitrarily strong time-dependent on-site terms, um, and uh, uh, they will not uh, speed up the propagation of information. And in this case, uh, Lieb and Robinson back in 1972 proved that uh, an effective uh, light cone emerges. So they showed that the signal after time t a distance r away um, is bounded from above by e to the vt minus r, uh, where v is of order one, uh, it's the Lee-Robinson velocity, and it comes from this one right here. So why did I say light cone? Well, uh, if you set this expression to a constant and solve for uh, uh, t as a function of r, uh, you find that uh, this uh, quantity must necessarily be small outside of uh, this light cone, t uh, similar to r, but it could be large inside of this uh, causal region. So Lee-Robinson bound proves that uh, your information cannot propagate faster than um, this linear light cone, although you can still have a small uh, exponential leakage outside uh, of the light cone because the system is not really uh, relativistic. So that's an emergent um, light cone in a non-relativistic system. I think when you say uh, arbitrary time dependence allowed, I, I can imagine this you know, includes also you know, sending some signal that propagates faster than anything and you know, interacts so I, don't, I think th th these type of signals, you want to classical signals that uh, move very, very fast in your system. Oh, yes, 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 right. Good point, right. So the question, now, now let's think, it depends on your question, uh, but let's suppose that uh, we, are, we have an unknown quantum state at one end of the chain, uh, a qubit in state A0 plus B1, and we don't know what that state is. Um, and then uh, we want to send that particular quantum information to the other end of the chain. Um, in this case, you can do whatever you want classically. You can make a classically correlated, you know, uh, you know, single site, uh, you know, um, control or this two qubit control that is, um, you know, subject to that bound. 
You just cannot send this unknown quantum state, unknown quantum state from one end to the other. It's true that if you knew it, you can do something very quickly. But if you don't know, there's actually indeed a sort of no limit on how quickly you can change uh, your things in time. Does that make sense? Maybe you should. Yeah, maybe you mean that as long as this time dependence does not have in itself uh, long range interactions. And... No, no, for now, yeah, for now it's just short range. I haven't gotten yeah. to long range yet. Yes, okay. yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, more questions? I mean, it's much more yeah, I, I do have a question. I do have a question about the interpretation of this as a light cone because uh, it's not that the the signal is zero outside the light cone, it's just small. Yes, yes. So how do I do with, how do I, how do I handle this with no signaling? Yeah, yeah. so this is an approximation, um, you know, to the true relativistic uh, system. But if I do start with this uh, description, um, you know, if I do start with this uh, Hamiltonian, it's just the, the feature of this non-relativistic Hamiltonian is that basically as soon as I turn it on, there was already a little bit of signal at the very end. I mean, it's tiny, but it's there. So it's just an approximation that we get from the uh, uh, non-relativistic uh, description of our system. Of course, if we do take into account relativity, there will be some true hard uh, you know, uh, limit and it will be given by the actual speed of light. But usually the Lieb-Robinson velocity that one gets here is really, really slow compared to the speed of light. So for all kind of intents and purposes, we can, we can ignore the true, you know, hard, uh, you know, light cone that's, that's much, much larger. Um, and uh, we instead kind of deal with this approximate, I mean, maybe light cone is a bad, uh, bad name. I mean, maybe you should call it the sound uh, cone or something. Uh, well, but, but the alternative interpretation might be that this is not, the commutator does not describe the propagation of information. It propagates, it describes something else. Um, so this is also a good question, right? So you can consider, uh, so I consider, for example, this, uh, um, you know, uh, operator norm, and it's appropriate to this uh, scenario that I just described, kind of this local quench. Um, but you can consider other things where um, maybe instead of the operator norm, um, another norm would be important, for example, the Frobenius norm. Um, but, you know, for some questions, certainly, as I, as I introduced it, for some questions, it certainly, uh, you know, it certainly makes sense. And, you know, it's just for, for the things that we assume that makes sense, right? Because uh, um, it's true that as soon as I turn my Hamiltonian on, there will be a little bit of knowledge, you know, about the state at, in the one end of the system uh, at the other end. It's just, it'll be really tiny. Uh, but that's just how non-relativistic, you know, uh, quantum mechanics uh, works. So, um, well, I, I don't want to be a pain in the neck, but in, in the relativistic theory, there is an analog of this, which is the Reich leader thing. So I don't know, I, I'm confused. Okay, well, um, I mean, we can, uh, I don't know, um, maybe we can uh, move on, uh, but so uh, yeah, I try to answer, we can, we can come back to it, uh, or I mean, I can stay afterwards uh, and we can chat. Uh, I mean, these are all good questions. I think I know answers, but maybe I failed to uh, convey them, so. More questions? Okay, yeah, no. Okay, right, so uh, so this bound uh, we learned is, uh, is very general. Um, you know, it only assumes uh, bounds on, your, on the strength of your interactions, uh, but it can really be arbitrarily time dependent and have arbitrary form. Um, so as a result, it has lots of applications. Um, it bounds uh, quantum communication through spin chains, uh, entanglement growth, speed of quantum computers and lots of other things that as I will describe later. So now we want to do the same thing for these one of R to the alpha interactions. So in particular, we want to know, uh, is there again, some sort of a causal region uh, within which uh, uh, our uh, information is uh, approximately contained, you know, up to some tails again. So what is the shape of this causal region? What is this function T uh, uh, that goes as F of R? What is this function f of r? In other words, where is the shortest time t to send quantum information over distance r? Um, um, you know, so it'll be bounded by this f of r. So I'm not gonna give any of the proofs. I will just tell you sort of uh, what is the state of the art uh, for this question? What are the best known bounds? Uh, then I will talk about applications of these bounds. And then I will tell you how close uh, do we get to saturating them. Um, 
So uh, here's again the setup uh, before I give you the answer. The setup is uh, you have uh, two qubit interactions between arbitrary pairs of qubits i and j. And now the strength of the interactions is bounded by one over distance to the power alpha. So again, up to this bound, I will allow for arbitrary time dependence on these uh, uh, largest eigenvalues. Again, I will allow, but I'm not showing here, uh, I will allow for single side terms that are arbitrarily strong and have arbitrary time dependence. And in fact, I will consider all alpha greater than or equal to zero, although I will mostly focus on alpha greater than the dimension of the system. So uh, again, I'm not gonna give you the proofs. I'll just tell you what the answers are uh, that are currently uh, known. So what is the shortest time t to send quantum information over distance r? in d dimensions using one of our to the alpha interactions. So the answer will of course depend on alpha. So at alpha equal to infinity, you know, we have the Lee-Robinson bound, that's short range interactions, and alpha equal to zero, that's all to all interactions. So uh, the first result from 2006 uh, said that for alpha greater than d, we cannot send information, you know, arbitrarily quickly, there's this really weak bound. T cannot be smaller than log R, but it's a really, really weak bound. So when we first started working on this, um, you know, back in 2015 or 13, um, we said that, well, actually, you can show that for alpha greater than 2D, you cannot go faster than R to some power beta, where beta is less than one. And this was the tightest bound, uh, you know, for a while, this algebraic bound. Um, until uh, last year and this year, there was this breakthrough um, where uh, Chen and Lucas and also Kuwahara and Saida showed that actually for alpha greater than the d plus one, you cannot go faster than linearly, uh, which it's basically the same bound as the Lee Robinson bound. So there's some critical alpha uh, above which you have to uh, uh, be linear. And there are also results for alpha less than d, but I'm not gonna bore you with this uh, because it's not too important for this talk. Uh, and we'll come back to this picture uh, later, this, but, but yeah. How is this defined, the, the sending quantum information over distance R? You're looking at some... Right, so I want for my unequal time commutator, that's a great question. Uh, I'm, uh -huh. I'm waiting for my unequal time commutator to become uh, of order one, you know, mm -hmm. 0.5 or something. Um, okay. And then I optimize over all possible, you know, uh, interactions, H, I, J of T over all possible two qubit interactions. I'm allowed to do anything I want uh, up to the bound that they cannot fall off slower than one of R to the alpha. Mm -hmm. I can also allow for arbitrary single side interactions that are arbitrarily strong and depend on time. Uh, so, and under these assumptions, you can prove this bound. And how bound, how tight are these bounds? Yes, yes, this will, I will come to that. Very good question. Right, so um, um, so we slightly improved on this bound, uh, r to the beta, by slightly improving uh, this value of beta. Uh, and there's a different result in d equals one and d greater than one. Don't worry about these formulas for now, but they will come in uh, useful later to answer uh, uh, Netanel's question about how tight we are. Uh, but for now, let's briefly discuss uh, applications. So I said these bounds are really uh, powerful, so uh, they must have some exciting applications. So first, uh, uh, you know, since that's how I introduced them, they bound uh, the effect on observable A, a distance uh, R away, uh, due to a quench on local quench on side B. Um, turns out they also bound the growth of connected correlations after a global quench. So assume uh, you have a system that starts with all qubits in state zero. It evolves under this Hamiltonian H uh, with power law decaying interactions and you're monitoring some connected correlator. So at time equal to zero, we have a product state. Uh, so the connected, this uh, correlator factorizes and we get a zero here. However, as time goes on, um, um, these connected correlations build up and there it turns out, they turn out to be bounded by uh, something related to these uh, uh, bounds that I described. Uh, you can also prove entanglement area laws for dynamics and gap ground states. So in particular, for a sufficiently large alpha, entanglement uh, within a given subregion cannot go grow faster than at a rate proportional to the, uh, uh, you know, in 2D, the perimeter of the system, and in 3D, the area of the system. 
And it makes sense, you know, because the uh, interactions that contribute to the growth of entanglement are those that straddle the boundary. And if alpha is sufficiently large, you can imagine that kind of they contribute only uh, something proportional to the uh, perimeter of the system in 2D. And you can prove uh, some similar statements uh, for gapped uh, ground states. Uh, you can also use uh, these Lee Robinson bounds to show that correlations in gapped ground states uh, of one of R to the alpha uh, Hamiltonians fall off no slower than one of R to the alpha. And this is similar to the short range result where you can prove uh, that correlations cannot fall off slower than an exponential. Uh, you can also place lower bounds on how quickly you can prepare topologically ordered states, which again makes sense because, you know, topologically ordered states, they have, uh, you know, this long range entanglement in them. Uh, and uh, Lee Robinson bounds uh, provide a bound on how quickly uh, entanglement can grow. It turns out you can also uh, place bounds on, he on the heating rate in periodically driven systems. Um, so suppose you're driving uh, uh, your system with a large frequency omega uh, that's much larger than the local energy scale in your system. Then in order to absorb the single quantum of energy omega, you need to spread it over many sites. Uh, however, Lee Robinson bounds constrain uh, how quickly uh, information can spread from one site to the other. Uh, and this allows you to uh, uh, bound how quickly uh, the system heats up on this periodic drive. You can also use these bounds to come up with more gate efficient methods for digital quantum simulation. So in digital quantum simulation, you're given some Hamiltonian that you're trying to simulate and you want to evolve your uh, quantum uh, computer uh, under this uh, unitary e to the minus IHT. And it makes sense that uh, if uh, you know something about how quickly entanglement can spread under this Hamiltonian, you can use this knowledge uh, to come up uh, with a more uh, clever uh, way to express uh, this unitary in terms of uh, single qubit and two qubit uh, gates. Similarly, if you're not interested in a full uh, state after uh, time evolution, but only in the local observable, you can again use Lee Robinson bounds to say that uh, uh, parts of the system that are far away from that observable, uh, you don't really care about, and this can again make your quantum simulation uh, more efficient. You can also place uh, lower bounds on the scrambling time. So quantum scrambling means that information that's initially stored in some subsystem gets spread to the complement of that system. And of course, spreading of this information is again, it's a it's transfer of quantum information. Uh, so it makes sense that Lee Robinson bounds can um, constrain how quickly this can happen. And finally, if I have time uh, at the end of the talk, I will uh, discuss separately that um, Lee Robinson bounds also uh, can uh, uh, help you uh, study classical simulation of quantum systems. So before I move on to uh, Netanel's question about uh, you know, uh, how quickly uh, do we come to saturating those bounds, are there any questions about applications? So for these uh, scrambling times, I thought these scrambling times are connected to this butterfly velocity, which can be different from the leap Robinson velocity. Is that right? Or yes, yes, indeed. Uh, however, you know, uh, however, uh, you know, it can be slower, uh, mm. but it cannot be faster. So uh, yeah, right, so exactly. Right. Right. And uh, and something else that's important is that uh, you know, in scrambling, what matters usually is the. Um, out of time order correlator. And this actually connects uh, not to the operator norm, uh, the largest eigenvalue of this unequal time commutator, but actually connects to the uh, um, uh, Frobenius norm, which is a different norm of this out of time order correlator. Uh, and this is also uh, important, but, but the spirit is roughly the same. Um, and you should actually check out this paper. This was actually a breakthrough here uh, in 2020 um, mm -hmm. by again, Andy Lucas and his uh, student. More questions? The, the Lee Robinson bounds you mentioned are upper bounds. So how do we get these lower bounds? So the Lee Robinson bounds are lower bounds on the uh, you know unequal time commutator. Uh, sorry, they're not. They're sorry. They are the upper bounds on equal time commutator, but they provide you a lower bound 
on the time it takes to send quantum information from, uh, uh, from one place to another. Um, right, so uh, does it make sense? So time is uh, greater or equal to R, for example. You know, that's the original Lee Robinson bound. So it's a, a, a lower bound on time, but it's an upper bound on the unequal time commutator. And that's exactly what you need in kind of, say, the scrambling, you know, how quickly, uh, so how quickly, for example, an unequal time commutator, um, like um, how quickly the, um, yeah. okay. um, um, the Frobenius norm of, a, uh, of an unequal time commutator between two sides grows. It's the same thing. Yeah, good question. More questions on applications? Okay, so let's come to, uh, wait, I'll talk about this later if I have time. Right, so these are our bounds. So these are the lower bounds on uh, how quickly you can send uh, uh, quantum information um, uh, over distance r using one of our the alpha interactions in d dimensions. So how quickly uh, can we actually do this right now? So what are the fastest known protocols? So um, for, um, you know, alpha greater than 2d plus 1, since we already have a, a bound uh, that says we cannot go faster than linearly, I can even do a linear uh, quantum information transfer just using swaps. Uh, so here the best bound is, uh, you know, t scaling is r, and so for alpha greater than 2d plus 1, our bound and our protocol actually agree. So that's good. So we're tight right here. So uh, just uh, about a month or two ago, we had actually a breakthrough um, uh, on these uh, uh, pr protocols for sending quantum information over distance r, and we proved that uh, uh, there exists a protocol, which I will talk about later, um, to send the quantum information over distance r in time that goes as r to the alpha minus 2d for alpha between 2d and 2d plus 1. So you see that it is sublinear. So if you plug in alpha in this region, it gives you something that goes as r to some power, you know, a beta, where beta is less than 1, so it's faster than linear but it's still algebraic. And now if you look at these bounds that we didn't look at carefully before, at d equal to 1, this actually matches the bound, uh, which is very exciting. And this bound was proved by Andy Lucas. For alpha greater than uh, 1, we don't yet have a matching uh, lower bound. There's this extra alpha minus d, so it's not r to the alpha minus 2d. It's something, uh, uh, you know, something looser. Um, but we're hoping to improve this bound uh, to match alpha minus 2d. So this is sort of partially tight. So it's tight in one dimension, but not quite tight yet in dimension greater than one. But we're working hard in tightening. And now between d and 2d, again in the same paper, to my shock, uh, we were able to prove uh, that we can pretty much go in logarithmic time. Um, not quite log to the power of one, but log to some other power that, uh, you know, that weakly depends on alpha. So, you know, this means that up to uh, sub, uh, uh, you know, polynomial corrections, we're basically tight here. Um, and at alpha equal to 2d, it's actually, it's now it's sub polynomial. So it's e to the gamma square root of log r. So without the square root, it would have been, uh, you know, polynomial, but with the square root, it's sub polynomial. But, but not quite polylogarithmic. So it's something in between. Um, and this uh, uh, log bound applies in 2D as well. So again, up to sub polynomial corrections, we're tight at 2D even. So this is, you know, this just happened uh, and I was very excited about this. Um, there are similar kind of, there are some results also for alpha less than D, but we're not tight there and I'm not gonna talk about this. So, I'm very excited about uh, you know these results here from a uh, you know a month uh, ago, um, and what they mean in particular that in two dimensions, dipolar interactions allow for a polylogarithmic protocol. So for d equal to two, uh, alpha equal to three uh, lies between uh, d equal to uh, uh, between between d and two d between two and four. So it's right here, and here we have basically a logarithmic protocol to some power I don't know some constant. And that's, again, kind of shocking to me. Um, I, I didn't really know that was possible. And then in three dimensions, even van der Waals interactions, which are alpha equal to six, allow for this uh, sub-polynomial protocol. 
And this was again shocking. So I thought that van der Waals interactions are basically short range for all intents and purposes. In fact, I thought that van der Waals interactions in three dimensions would basically be linear. Um, but not only are they sublinear, they're in fact subpolynomial, uh, which is totally crazy. Um, so in the next slides, I will explain how this protocol works. Uh, are there any questions about this slide? Okay, so how does this protocol work? I will not show all the details. I will just give you some um, uh, intuition. So the goal uh, uh, that we have is uh, to, uh, we start with a spin chain, although the protocol works in any dimension, I will explain it on a spin chain. And we're trying to send the quantum information, uh, some unknown state A0 plus B1 from one end of the chain to the other. Um, so that's our goal. We wanna start with this state and we wanna end up with that state. We assume that all the intermediate qubits start in state zero. Uh, and again, we don't know what these A and B are. And we wanna do this using our uh, unitary long range interactions. So here's gonna be our overall uh, strategy. We're first gonna encode uh, the single qubit in a large uh, GHZ like state. So A0, 0, 0, 0 plus B1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And then we're gonna basically undo this encoding, but sort of in reverse so that information gets mapped onto the last qubit. So we're gonna encode and then decode. So the question now is how to use a uh, long range interactions to do this encoding and decoding uh, quickly. Um, so let's suppose, and I will explain how to do this later, but suppose we can merge several of these GHG states into one big GHG state. So here's what I mean by this uh, suppose. Uh, so suppose we have this encoded a uh, small GHC like state A0, 0 plus B11 here, and we have three smaller GHC states 0, 0, 0 plus 111. You know, I'm dropping the normalization. So suppose we know how to quickly merge uh, these uh, three states, uh, these four states, uh, into a large encoded uh, GHG state. Suppose we know how to do this, and I'll tell you how to do that. So then our overall strategy will be to repeatedly merge nearby GHG states into larger ones. So we first start with an initial state where the first qubit in the state is in this unknown state A0 plus B1, but all the other qubits are in state 0 plus 1. And then in the first step, we merge uh, you know, these three qubits into one uh, encoded uh, GHG state, A0, 0 plus B1, 1. And then we merge uh, the next, uh, you know, kind of these three qubits into 0, 0 plus 1, 1. And again, uh, we merge them in, in threes. Then what we do is we merge now these three GHG states into one encoded GHG state. And those three and these three in bigger symmetric states. And finally, we merge the whole thing into one big encoded GHG state, all using basically a kind of these merging strategy. And I will give later some intuition for why, you know, this is actually a fast uh, thing to do. But for now, I need to explain to you how to do this merging. So maybe uh, before I explain how to do the merging, is the basic idea at least uh, clear? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. So, right, I, so after you get this GHZ state on the full, system, how do you kind of extract it to the final qubit? You just measure the- Yeah, you just undo. No, you undo. Look, you did this right. merging so and that's the unitary process. So now if you reflect your entire system and just yeah. undo everything you've done unitarily, you will exactly map it onto the right qubit. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So more questions on, on this slide is just the intuition. So um... you said I'm trying to avoid making swaps. swaps. Yeah, right. So yeah, swaps right. are slow. Swaps are slow. Right. And we have interactions, like everybody interacts, uh, right? Uh, but right. interactions somehow fall off. So we're trying to make use of uh, long range, but long range interactions that fall off. That's, that's why you want to have a group. group right. Group. That's why we want to group them. We yeah. want kind of things interacting in groups. And I, it's, it's a great question. So I will explain why kind of this intuition makes sense. Right. So how do we merge these GAG states? This is the main thing. That's the only thing that remains to do. How do you merge them? And once I explain how you merge them, then uh, you'll be done. So this is the, the hardest slide uh, in the talk. So let's suppose I have these uh, uh, 
uh, two states. So here is an encoded GHG state where our information sits, and here's a symmetric state. Uh, and I want to, uh, uh, and let's suppose this is, this is length L. So here are their L qubits, and here are their L qubits. And the distance between the leftmost qubit here and the rightmost qubit, rightmost qubit here is R. So, you know, there could be some other things right here. I mean, we would simultaneously be merging this state with that state and this state with the other one, but let's focus on just two of them. Uh, and I'm trying to merge these uh, six qubits into one encoded six qubit uh, GHG state. Uh, so let me introduce this notation. I will denote 0, 0, 0 by 0 bar and 1, 1, 1 by 1 bar. And similarly here, to simplify the notation a little bit. And also, I just don't want to carry these, uh, three, these intermediate qubits with me. You know, I'll just remove them. Nothing will really change. So uh, um, let's imagine for simplicity that they sit next to each other, but they don't have to. This distance r can be much larger than 2L. I don't want to confuse you with this. So how do I merge them? Uh, right, right. So the goal is to create this state now. The goal is to merge them into a, a six qubit encoded GHG state. And the way I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna turn on my Hamiltonian of strength one over R to the alpha, where R is the largest distance between the uh, any two qubits uh, in this red and in this green region. And I'm allowed to do this by assumption of what my Hamiltonian is. And then what this Hamiltonian does, it couples every site in the red region to every site in the green region with a simple you know, projector on one times projector on one. So it means if I have a, a qubit in state one here and a qubit in state one there, uh, then the state starts picking up a phase and nothing else happens otherwise. And this is consistent with our bound on interactions but of course, interactions closer, you know, they can be stronger, but I'm allowed to make them weaker because, uh, you know, this was our bound on the interaction. I'm not forced to use interactions of the full strength. And so the reason why I'm applying this Hamiltonian is that out of this state now, the state where uh, the left uh, region, the red region in the state one bar, one, 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 and the right region is in the state one, 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 only this uh, you know, state starts picking up a phase relative to the other three states at a rate that scales as L squared of R to the alpha. So one of R to the alpha comes from here. And now L squared comes from the fact that there are L qubits uh, in here and L qubits in there. And you know, there are L squared terms in this Hamiltonian. And every term in this Hamiltonian uh, helps you pick up the phase between, uh, you know, between this state and the other three states. So is it clear what's happening? So, uh, you know, I decompose this product of uh, two states into four, uh, in a linear combination of four things and only one of them is picking up a phase. So this means that after time, that's basically pi times the inverse of this, um, the state one bar, one bar has picked up a minus sign. I applied basically sort of like a, a sort of a pi phase there. And I've entangled my uh, red uh, state uh, with my green state. So this is almost what we wanted. You know, we wanted this uh, GHZ state uh, on all of them, but it's not quite. So what we need to do is we need to somehow rotate this encoded state 0 plus 1 into an encoded state 0, and this encoded state 0 minus 1 in the encoded state 1. And then we would be done. Um, so this encoding is a little bit tricky, um, and I won't explain it in uh, this uh, rotation, excuse me, is a little bit tricky, so I won't explain it in detail. Uh, but the idea is that uh, to uh, do this rotation in this uh, GHZ basis, I need to basically decode uh, this state into a single qubit, rotate that single qubit, and then encode it back. So uh, in pictures, you know, I have this encoded qubit right here. So what I do, I use everything I've just described, this merging and unmerging of GHG states to decode it onto a single qubit. Then I rotate it by applying a Hadamard gate. Zero plus one goes to zero and zero minus one goes to one. And then I uh, encode it back in. So this entire procedure is kind of very, uh, very recursive. So uh, I use these language interactions to create these things in the first place. And then while I merge them, I need to use the entire procedure again uh, to kind of uh, uh, 
decode uh, and then uh, encode again. So that's the basic idea. And after I'm, I've rotated, again, I've done my merging. So that's the basic intuition for the merging. And the key point here is that the rate uh, or the time it takes you to do the merging is r to the alpha over l squared. So the larger l is, the faster you can merge them. And that's what Netanel, what you said. That's why, you know, you need to merge larger ch chunks together. So if the two chunks are large, this, you know, this L is uh, large. So it means that the distance between these two things can also be larger. Um, and that's the basic idea. So now back to our picture, you know, when we're trying to use now this merging protocol to merge these small GHG states into large GHG states, um, you know, suppose we want to merge these three guys, each of length L, uh, into one big one. So the merging takes time roughly r to the alpha over l squared. So it means that larger l um, allow you to uh, use a sort of a larger r. Um, and that's why, you know, when we're at the next step, you know, our l is larger, so we can use an even larger r. We can use the r equal to the full chain. And this is what allows us to make these bigger and bigger uh, GHG states. So that's as far as I'm going to go and trying to explain the intuition uh, uh, behind this new protocol. So are, any, are there any questions on this? Okay. Mm -hmm. Questions now? Okay. So, uh, so outlook now uh, on these bounds and the protocols. So uh, we would like to finish tightening our bounds and protocols in particular, you know, if you remember between a uh, 2D and 2D plus one uh, in dimension D greater than one, we still need to improve um, our bound, we think, and we're working on this. Uh, there are lots of other interesting things that one can do and that we're working on, and it relates to uh, 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 Joseph's question, also Netanel's. Um, um, in particular, you can do, uh, you can ask different questions. You can, for example, try restricting uh, uh, what you want. Uh, for example, you can restrict uh, to uh, working only within the, uh, with a single particle that hops. So it's a very restricted Hilbert space that's no longer exponential. Uh, and then you can come up with tighter bounds. You can also change the question you're asking. Um, instead of sending quantum information from one end to the other, knowing what the state of the intermediate qubits are, you can suppose that you don't know what the intermediate state, uh, uh, what, what, uh, state the intermediate qubits are in. And in that case, it's harder to send quantum information. In that case, you can get tighter bounds. Uh, similarly, for these out-of-time order correlators, which are uh, at infinite temperature, the Frobenius norm instead of the uh, uh, operator norm, it turns out you can also get tighter bounds. You can also generalize. Um, uh, I talked about uh, two qubit interactions uh, in a closed system. You can uh, do similar things in open systems. And you can similarly generalize um, from two qubit interactions to interactions that involve multiple qubits, but that still fall off uh, appropriately uh, quickly. Uh, and this also all exists. And then the hope is that uh, you know, all of these protocols and bounds, they will help improve our understanding of equilibrium and non-equilibrium properties of uh, long interacting many body systems and will allow us to speed up unbound quantum computing, quantum simulation, classical simulation, preparation of entangled states for metrology and sensing, um, et cetera. So um, um, I will take now some questions on this Lee Robinson part. And then if we have time after questions, uh, I can talk for maybe uh, you know seven or whatever, 10 minutes uh, about this classical simulation, but we don't have to. Um, uh, I'll be happy to hear that. So. Let's see if there are any questions about the Lee Robinson part. Uh, there was a question here in the chat. Somebody's asking whether, uh, you know, whether when you kind of compute the total time for the protocol, do you take into account the single qubit rotations, decoding, and then coding? Yeah, very good question. Yeah. Right. So single qubit rotations are no problem because I assume that I have arbitrarily strong on-site Hamiltonians, so I can do them arbitrarily quickly. Encoding and decoding, yes, we do take this into account. Um, um, and I glossed over this, but it is taken into account. So everything is, of course, taken into account. But the analysis is tricky, so that's why I didn't show you any formulas. Um, right. I actually, I mean, it, it might be a silly question, but, uh, you know, 
So I have a bunch of atoms, say Rydberg atoms, they're, they're interacting with an one over whatever R to the alpha interaction. Yeah. But in, and then you, you're predicting, I don't know, say uh, sublinear, sublinear uh, time. Right. The uh, polynomial, sublinear, or even log, polylog. Right. Or, uh, right. But you know, at the end of the day, th these are just uh, just electromagnetism. I mean, there's special relativity. So somehow, as I scale up the system, at some point, it has this has to break down, and I have to go back to linear. So how does yes. that happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's the same question. It's very similar to the question that uh, that, that Joseph asked. Um, um, so yeah, so your van der Waals interactions, one of our six interactions that we write as instantaneous, you know, interactions right. between two qubits that are uh, uh, arbitrarily far away, that's an approximation. You know, you don't have instantaneous interactions. Right. Interactions are mediated by the photon. So uh, whenever, whenever the time scale that you're predicting, you know, uh, starts uh, to be comparable to, uh, you know, distance divided by the speed of light, you need to, uh, you know, take all of this kind of uh, into yeah. account. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, I, I don't think, I mean, I don't think it will be a, a problem um, kind of, uh, I mean, in fact, the whole thing is pretty difficult to implement. The protocol is pretty complicated. So uh, nobody, I think, is going to be implementing this protocol just yet. Um, but I think, uh, the first thing they will see will not be bounded by this, uh, you know, L over C. I mean, you need pretty large distances for that. So uh, do you uh, do you have a number? Like, suppose I take, I don't know, Rydberg Adams, uh, um, you know, if you, what would be the, 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 the scale of the system for which I would see, a, you know, I see going, you know, the, 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 the predictions of the long range interactions actually going back. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm too embarrassed to do a, kind of this back of the envelope uh, calculations, uh, but, uh, but I think, you know, the typical systems are really small, you know, these are, you know, uh, atoms uh, in, a, in a single trap, and when you, you know, do, uh, you know, sort of L over C, you get a tiny number, and uh, you're very rarely, uh, and, and, then, and then these Rydberg interactions, you know, they're strong, they're not like crazy strong, so, uh, but, you know, I'm too embarrassed to plug in numbers. Yeah, I don't think it'll be a problem, but, uh, you know. Okay. Other questions about this uh, Lee Robinson part? Uh, anyone? Okay. Okay, so I can talk for maybe, uh, you know, seven minutes or so about the other part and then, uh, you know, we'll stop. Right, so classical simulation of quantum systems and it connects to Lee Robinson as I will explain in a second. So uh, if you uh, weren't listening to the first part, you can actually start listening now. It'll be, uh, you know, more or less uh, independent except, you know, for one connection. Uh, so, in general, our belief in the power uh, of quantum computers and the excitement that we have over studying many-body quantum systems, they really all come from uh, our belief that realistic uh, quantum systems cannot be efficiently simulated in a classical computer. But what exactly does it mean to classically simulate a quantum system? Uh, so, consider a typical modern quantum experiment where you have an initial state of n qubits, uh, maybe these two qubits in state zero, and then you evolve them under some Hamiltonian, and you get the uh, general superposition, uh, in this case of the uh, four uh, basis states, and then you measure every qubit in the computational basis, and you get, you know, one of the uh, uh, bit strings for the probability co corresponding to the amplitude squared. So it means that one experiment, if you just repeat the same thing over and over, is just one sample uh, from this distribution. So this means that a perfect uh, classical simulator of this experiment is just a classical algorithm that produces samples from the same distribution. And then you will not be able to distinguish this uh, classical uh, you know, machine from your uh, quantum computer because they just both produce samples from the same distribution. Now we're interested in efficient classical simulation so an efficient classical simulator is an algorithm that produces a sample from the same distribution in time that's polynomial in the number of qubits. Finally, you know, your quantum experiment is never perfect. Uh, so it's unfair to ask for the classical simulator to be perfect. So then we define an efficient approximate uh, sampler or classical simulator uh, as an algorithm that samples from a distribution that's epsilon close to the desired distribution in time that's polynomial in both n 
uh, and one over epsilon. And uh, for the rest of the uh, you know talk, for the rest of the remaining five minutes, I will talk about these approximate samplers, uh, um, but I will drop the word approximate. Uh, and uh, people have shown uh, you know in the past you know ten years or so uh, that there's very good evidence that approximate classical sampling from some quantum systems uh, is hard. So in the case, uh, hard meaning that it cannot be done efficiently on a classical computer. So in the case of Aaron and Arkhipov, they uh, study this non-interacting uh, bosons and it's called boson sampling. And Bremner and collaborators, they study the spin system, um, um, uh, but with similar kind of conclusions. So uh, uh, sampling complexity, in other words, or how hard it is to sample from a given uh, distribution is really a key tool for studying many body quantum systems because that's what uh, many modern quantum experiments do. They, they sample from these uh, 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 complicated distributions. And indeed people have realized uh, that perhaps the easiest path to quantum supremacy is to make a quantum system sample uh, from some complicated distribution. And that's what the uh, Google superconducting uh, experiment did they had a 53 qubits and they uh, applied random circuits and then they uh, did this uh, sampling. Uh, one can in principle play uh, similar games, for example, in Chris Monroe's trapped ions where they can uh, implement uh, spin Hamiltonians on up to you know, 50 qubits. Uh, and we did a, a different thing. We did this uh, QAOA, quantum approximate uh, optimization algorithm in this paper, but we also uh, you know, on the side played a simple 12 qubit sampling game. Of course, it's not as impressive as this. Okay, so um, what happens uh, to sampling complexity as a function of time? Why did it sample only 12 ions in this experiment? They have 50. Oh, because uh, 50 is, uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we, we had only 12 in that particular experiment. So 50 is uh, kind of the largest you can get, uh, but it becomes poorly controllable. Uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, right. We wanted to do it on 50, you know, we wanted to beat uh, John Martinez, but, uh, but some things didn't work out. So uh, unfortunately, otherwise we would have been famous. So yeah. now he's famous. Okay. Right. So, um, so what happens to the sampling complexity as a function of time? So time equals zero, uh, you have a product state and then you have this general uh, superposition. So time equal to zero, if you make your measurement, you always get zero, zero. So that's a very easy uh, distribution to sample from classically. You just give zero, zero every time. On the other hand, for a sufficiently large system, this general distribution is actually hard to sample from, as I mentioned, uh, um, as shown by you know, these and other works. So it looks like uh, there's sort of a transition, uh, which you maybe can call uh, um, speculatively dynamical phase transition from easy sampling at short times to hard sampling at long times. And maybe to show it differently, you can think of all of your quantum states uh, as being composed of states that are easy to sample classically and those that are hard to sample classically. And then you start in here and as a function of time, you evolve out to there um, undergoing a transition at some point. So let's compare this uh, to a typical condensed matter phase diagram where uh, as a function of temperature and system parameters, you have some ordered phase, um, uh, maybe a non-zero sigma z order parameter and a disordered phase uh, with a zero order parameter. Uh, and then you undergo, your order parameter undergoes a non-analyticity uh, at the phase transition. So now in these synthetic quantum matter systems, people like studying dynamical phase transitions where you replace temperature with time and you start with some initial state and you just evolve uh, uh, the state. And then some uh, observable undergoes a non uh at the phase transition. So uh, what we propose is really to use the sampling complexity as the order parameter. So at short times, it'll be easy to sample. And at long times, uh, it'll be hard to sample. So this is the last slide. Um, um, so we considered one particular example, interacting bosons on a lattice. Um, in particular, we placed the N of these uh, bosons that are evenly spaced on an N by N uh, 2D square lattice like this. Um, because we have N of them on an uh, N squared sites, the distance between them is square root of N. Uh, we let them evolve under this uh, Bose-Hubbard type Hamiltonian with nearest neighbor hopping. Um, 
that is bounded by one of our R to the alpha, because we want to use our Lee Robinson bounds. Um, and we have an on-site Hubbard interaction. Now, at, uh, for alpha equal to infinity, that's nearest neighbor hopping. That's just ultra cold atoms and optical lattices. And for u equals to infinity, we have hardcore interactions. And that's just these one of our R cubed and one of our the six spin models with Rydberg atoms, polar molecules, et cetera. So it's a very general Hamiltonian. But the initial state is very special. So, uh, uh, and the goal is, and I'm wrapping up, so the goal is to evolve uh, the system and, under this Hamiltonian and measure where the bosons are. And the question is, is it easy or hard to classically simulate it in the worst case over all possible uh, GIJFT subject to this bound? In other words, is it easy or hard to sample from the same distribution? Um, and here's the answer. So uh, uh, as a function of time and as a function of alpha, so for short times and for short range interactions, it's easy. And for long times and long range interactions, it's hard. And we don't know here in the middle. So, and to prove the easiness, we use actually Lee Robinson bounds. Um, and to prove hardness, we reduce it to some of these uh, results from Aaron and Arkipov and Brenner and collaborators. And it's good to prove that things are hard or easy because you know, if we want your quantum, your quantum system, if you want your quantum system to give you some exponential speed up, uh, over a classical system, you should not be looking in this easy regime, you should be looking in this hard regime. So okay. is, it, is, it, yeah. is it a crossover or is it an actual transition? Right, so that's a great question. Um, so, uh, and maybe, so, so let's, so, so maybe I'll, I'll actually stop the main talk right here. I'll skip the outlook. So these are already the questions. Uh, so, um, right, so um, let's parameterize our time as n to some power beta. Um, so look, so I'm looking for a time that's not a, like it's not a constant time. It's yeah. a time that gets longer and longer, the larger your system is. But let's parameterize it as a function, uh, as a function, as, as, a, as this beta, n to the beta. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is I tune beta. So beta equal to zero means I consider constant time. Beta equals to one means I consider time that scales as the sign of the system. Yeah. And beta equal to one half means that I consider uh, time that uh, goes as square root of n. Mm -hmm. So it is as a function of this beta uh, that I undergo a transition from easy to hard. And it is actually, you know, it is actually kind of a sharp transition uh, in the sense that uh, for any beta smaller than one half, I can demonstrate an, an algorithm that efficiently samples in polynomial time uh, from the same distribution. And for beta greater than one half, I can prove basically that such a polynomial algorithm doesn't exist. Mm, but, but you do have this hatch region where, where you don't know. And here we don't know, but, uh, but the point is that, you know, uh, because our, our hardness is defined as basically not easiness, uh, you know, it defi is defined as the absence of the algorithm, um, it has to be all either easy or hard. Here is just our failure of proving. Uh, so it will all basically, it's kind of has to be hard, uh, it has to be a sharp transition by definition. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to skip the uh, outlook since I'm out of time. So, you know, we, um, we, we want to use sampling complexity as an order parameter uh, studying these dynamical phase transitions. Um, um, and we want to do this for everything, fermions, spins, anions, um, ground states, uh, open systems, partial measurements, etc. cetera. Um, so let me thank my group members. Uh, so lots of people, I mean, I talked about lots of things. Uh, so lots of people contributed here. Um, and in particular, Ming Tran, he was the one who uh, led the work in this protocol that I described, but lots of people contributed uh, and even more people. So thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, do we have questions for Alexei? Yeah, sorry, I ran over time a little bit. Oh, no, we have so it's not, I'll, I'll bug again with the same issue. <laughs> 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 I think one thing I learned from a Rorlich Popescu box is that there is no, there is apparently, perhaps I misunderstood their message, but that there is apparently no relation, no at least direct relation between the strength of correlation and the ability to signal. Now, uh, uh, do you, am I, 
Is this the right conclusion? Do you contest it or you are happy with this? Uh, uh, it's probably, I suspect that this, I suspect that, uh, um, I suspect that that conclusion that you're talking about probably was made under different assumptions from what I'm talking about. Um, so in my case, um, um, you know, there is a relationship between them. And in particular, let's suppose I start with a quantum system in a product state, uh, zero, 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 and I evolve it unitarily under some Hamiltonian, and I'm trying to uh, uh, build, um, you know, a connected correlation, a connected correlation between, say, the, uh, you know, uh, the leftmost side and the rightmost side. Uh, so in this case, I actually I can use the. Uh, and let's talk about short range interactions. Forget about long range. So uh, I can prove basically uh, this Lee Robinson bound, and using this Lee Robinson bound, I can also prove that this connected correlator between the uh, the end uh, qubits um, also could not become a of order one uh, faster than time that is proportional to the uh, to the distance uh, between these qubits because uh, they sort of need to be able to. Um, um, you know, they need to be able to uh, kind of establish this correlation in some way. Uh, so yeah, so I can test it, but I'm sure it's just uh, it's just a matter of a different assumption. Um, and that's not my work. You know, the thing about this connected correlations, you know, this was done, uh, you know, before me. So um, now, if I take seriously what you just said, then you don't contest it. Because as I understand your lecture, you really talked about the propagation of correlation. All I, all I was saying is that it requires some doing to relate correlations with signaling. Oh, yes, so yes, the yes, fact it's that, not exactly, that correlations yes, yes. are large does not yet necessarily imply anything about propagation of information or signaling. So it's, it's just not the same thing, that's all. But it's I'm not happy. the same thing, absolutely, it's not As the same thing. You're talking about correlations, I'm happy. Yes, yes, it's uh, not the same thing, I agree. So I guess then I don't contest. Uh, okay, yeah. More, more questions? I actually have a small question about something. You probably said it, but I, and I didn't catch it, but it's still. Um, so it seems like the protocol you described, you always uh, like you start from say three uh, correlated, um, right. correlated sites and go to nine and 27 and so forth. Right. Right. And, and so it's look, it looks like an exponential expansion, and the, 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 there is this time constant that for every stage. So why so why does this doesn't this uh, protocol work for every alpha and just the rate is a, is slower for every alpha? Why why? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Good point. Yeah. So everything was schematic here. So it turns out depending on the value of alpha. Uh, there is just, uh, you know, it depends on actually how quickly you can grow it. So, uh, you know, for certain values of alpha, uh, you know, you can uh, increase the size of your GHG state by a constant. So like in that example that I showed, it was by a factor of three. Mm -hmm. um, for, for, you know, for smaller values of alpha, you can grow it actually faster. Um, and for uh, larger values of alpha, you kind of have to uh, grow it slower. Um, so this was just a schematic, basically. And uh, yeah, so there, there are a lot of details there. Yes, yes, yeah, that's a good question. So it just uh, like the, the, you can't always multiply it. Like yes, yes, you can't, you can't just always multiply. It. And sometimes in order to get the, the kind of the fast protocol, you need to multiply it actually kind of by more and more as you go. Uh, yeah. So uh, I showed kind of uh, an example, but, uh, but you can, you, you sometimes you have to go slower, sometimes you can go faster, yeah. Oh, got it, great, thanks. Yeah. More questions? Um, hi, uh, thank you for a really, uh, truly great talk. Um, I have, a, a, um, okay, a question about the first part. Do you believe that a time independent protocol exists? And about the second part, does this imply that, uh, say, log depth uh, uh, circuits are classically simulable? Uh, I mean, uh, log depth uh, circuits with uh, short, um, local circuits uh, in any dimension. Right, so uh, so about a time independent protocol, um, I, I, I'm almost positive like, uh, so, right, so I'm almost positive that, uh, I mean, I can't prove it, but I'm almost positive that a time independent protocol that saturates kind of these newest bounds like this log R to the cap and this thing, that time independent protocol doesn't exist. It could be, it could be that maybe, um, 
I mean, it could be possibly that maybe it exists for every distance R, maybe a, there is a particular protocol that saturates it at like one particular T, uh, but not like at every T and R. Like there's no time and better protocol that just keeps propagating your information at the speed limit. Uh, but even that I think is very unlikely. I mean, this is a very complicated protocol. So I don't think a uh, uh, time independent protocol exists. Now, as far as, um, um, as far as a, a quantum simulation, so, uh, I mean, this kind of, I mean, it depends on what you mean by quantum simulation, right? So uh, um, if you talk about uh, quantum simulation in the sense of sampling, um, then uh, we believe that actually in uh, two dimensions, even a constant depth quantum circuit is hard to simulate. So uh, it's, it's basically, uh, you know, you basically prepare a, a cluster state uh, and uh, you sort of do this uh, kind of, you do basically universal uh, quantum computing on it. Um, um, so, so you're yeah. saying that circuits are harder than Hamiltonians? I mean, no, no, I no. Just look, no, no, they're uh, not. Because if I look at the alpha equals infinity axis here. Right. It seems that for, for time smaller than n to the power half, you say it's easy? Um. Oh, so this was a, no, no. So this is a, this picture is for a, a particular initial state for a particular system. You know, I considered a, yeah, yeah. So this is a, this is a trick that I played. You know, I played this trick where I put my bosons really far away uh, just to get an interesting diagram. If I put them all together and they weren't nicely spaced, it would get hard right away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's for a special initial state. But if I put them all together, it will get hard after a constant time, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, more questions? Uh, okay. Okay. So, if not, uh, I think we can uh, thank Alexei for a wonderful talk. Uh, and until uh, next time, I guess. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Nadnal. Thanks, everybody, yeah. for asking questions. Yeah, uh, and uh, good luck to all of us uh, with yeah. the. Uh, uh, with the pandemic and everything else. Yeah. Okay. Man. Thanks a lot. See you guys. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks again. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much.